Okay, so, wow, um, you've really uh, sent over some interesting stuff for us to dive into this time. A new world order, and it's not just, you know, the usual internet stuff this time. We're talking excerpts from some kind of online presentation, official UN documents even, and there's some deep historical analysis thrown in there too. It's really something. At first glance, you wouldn't think these sources would have much in common, but they all seem to be circling around this idea of a powerful entity shaping our future. It's true, yeah. And from what we can tell, you're particularly interested in how these global trends, like this digital public infrastructure or DPI, could be used as, well, tools of control. The online presentation really hones in on that angle. Yeah, for sure. And they have a pretty um, unexpected group in mind for the masterminds behind it all. Right. The Roman Catholic Church. Right, right. And just to be super clear up front, we'll be digging into all of these claims, but we are not here to endorse any one viewpoint. Oh, yeah. We're here as your guides, breaking down the arguments and evidence presented so you can come to your own conclusions. Exactly. And to be fair... They are making some pretty out there claims in this presentation. Like they're saying that the UN's global digital compact, this recent thing, it's not just about convenience like, you know, they say it is. They're saying it's actually evidence of a long standing plan by the Catholic Church to regain global dominance. And the way they describe it is, well, it's pretty vivid. Like they actually compare it to that old cartoon Pinky in the Brain. Oh, wow! you know, that small group pulling the strings, manipulating everyone else. It's a powerful image to conjure up, this idea that a select few are orchestrating events for their own benefit. It really gets at that primal fear of being controlled. Yeah, definitely. And it definitely gets your attention, right? Yeah. It doesn't stop there. They talk about rapid movements happening right now in technology and global governance and compare it to what Ellen White wrote about the end times. AI development is a big one for them. Things like Optimus robots, even self-driving cars, stuff moving at lightning speed. It's interesting that they emphasize the speed of it all. It creates this sense of urgency, like things are getting out of control before we can even wrap our heads around them, let alone question them. And that can really make people more susceptible to fear-based narratives. It's true, especially when you start talking about things like biometric travel, you know. You just walk onto a plane, no more lines, no more waiting. Sounds futuristic, but is it all it's cracked up to be? That's the thing about framing. It really is. And then they go on to say that, get this, 99% of U.S. Congress are secretly Catholics or Jesuits, all in position to just hand power over to Rome. And then there's this whole 10 regions mystery. Oh, yeah, the map. This map. The map. From 1942. Apparently, it divides the whole post-war world into 10 regions. Mm -hmm. And here's the kicker. It lines up with the 10 horns mentioned in the Book of Revelation. Coincidence? They don't think so. It does kind of feel like a real-life Da Vinci Code, you know? Yeah. These types of arguments where you're trying to find patterns are always intriguing. It's easy to start to think there's some hidden hand at play when you start connecting the dots between seemingly unrelated things. But we got to remember, correlation doesn't equal causation. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's try to break down what they're saying about DPI. What is it exactly? How does it work? And why are they so concerned about it? So at its core, you can think of DPI like a digital nervous system. Okay. It's basically a network that connects people, data, and even money, all so that governments can provide services more efficiently. Things like digital IDs, platforms to make payments, systems to exchange data, all streamlined, all interconnected. So on the surface, it sounds pretty convenient. Yeah, that's the idea, to simplify those everyday processes and improve access to essential services. But... The presenter is saying that the U.N. is being deliberately vague about how biometrics would factor into DPIs. Mm -hmm. Facial recognition, digital health IDs with your entire medical history, even digital land registries. They bring up all kinds of things. And their example for all of this is India. Okay. India has been way ahead of the curve when it comes to developing and actually implementing DPIs. Their digital health system, their biometric travel systems, even a unified payment interface, they are pushing the limits of what this technology can do. It's impressive, sure, but at what cost, that, right? And that gets right to the heart of their argument. Because while this technology is being presented as progress, and yeah, some of it does sound pretty convenient, the speaker is arguing that it could really easily be used to monitor and control and entire populations. It's the potential for misuse that's setting off alarm bells. Right. Think about it. Your whole life, your identity, your finances, it could all be linked to a single system. Hmm. That's a ton of power concentrated in one place. And that's what I keep coming back to, you know, like they actually say these DPIs could be used to 
switch off anybody who doesn't just go along with whatever mandates come down the line. It's like a digital thumbs up or thumbs down. Yeah, exactly. Like imagine not being able to get to your money, travel, or even prove that you own your own home because you didn't go along with some government directive. That's a real fear for a lot of people. As we go more and more digital, the possibility of these systems being used to restrict access to, you know, basic necessities, essential services, it becomes a real possibility. It's like something straight out of a dystopian novel, mm -hmm. you know, and it gets even wilder. They try to connect these modern developments to the historical goals of the Catholic Church. They even bring up these people in cyclicals, some from as far back as the 1800s. It's like they're saying this has been in the works for centuries. I will say the way they tie it all together is interesting. Oh, yeah. It's definitely intriguing. It really is. Yeah. Think about it. They bring up stuff from Alice Bailey, even the Club of Rome, and they argue that these groups, even decades ago, were laying the foundation for this type of global system. It's like they're saying that all these threads from history are coming together right now. Right. Like this is the culmination of some grand plan that's been playing out for generations. It's a big claim, to be sure. Yeah, they don't shy away from controversy either. Like, they say that Rome's whole thing was social justice, wealth redistribution, workers' rights, all stuff that a lot of people see as good things, right? And that have been talked about in UN goals, even in these DPI initiatives. They say it's all just a big act, that it's all manipulation to gain public support so that they can just bring in, you guessed it, global control. Don't fall for the nice guy act. That's what they're saying. It's all about power. Yeah. And it's definitely a different way of looking at things. They even bring up Ayn Rand's criticisms of the Vatican's social justice agenda from way back in the 60s. Oh, yeah. She was a serious individualist. Any kind of collectivist ideology, she was immediately suspicious. That's putting it mildly. She called the Catholic Church an institution that was recovering from a mortal wound and said that if they ever got their power back, we'd be looking at a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. Wow. Intense, right? They're, those are some strong words. Yeah. And they play right into this narrative the speaker is building. I mean, think about it. Ayn Rand, she was writing at the height of the Cold War. Everybody was afraid of communism, totalitarianism. That was a real fear back then. And you know what? What she said back then, it still resonates today with the anxieties people feel about who has the power. Governments, corporations, it's all the same. And when you have technology evolving as fast as it is today, yeah. it makes sense why people would be worried about who's steering the ship. Absolutely. And you know what this brings us to? What might be the most concerning part of this whole thing? This idea that they're going to impose one single ideology across the world and the speaker. They believe that ideology has its roots in the Catholic Church's stance on Sunday sacredness. Right. This is where their whole take on biblical prophecy really comes into play. We're talking Revelation 13.1617, that Mark of the Beast passage. Yeah. Probably the most debated and speculated on part of the Bible. Oh, for sure. It's some heavy stuff. It is. For sure. And they believe that this mark is going to be connected to a global economic system, one that's controlled by this new world order. They say it'll be used to force people into worshiping on Sundays. Okay. And because everything would be digital in this system, Payments, IDs, access to services, all of it. They say it would be scarily easy to just exclude anyone who doesn't buy into this forced ideology. Just deny them access, cut them off. It's a chilling thought. There's no question about that. Right. And then, and this is where it gets even more real. They bring up the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, yeah. All the lockdowns, the vaccine mandates, wow. the rise in digital tracking and all that. They see it all as a test run for this system of control. Like a way of getting people used to these measures in the name of safety, the common good. Exactly. So what they're saying is that the DPI itself might not be the actual mark of the beast, but it's the setup, the infrastructure that could be used to enforce it. And that's what makes it so creepy. It's not about force. It's about creating a world where disagreeing becomes almost impossible. You're either in or you're out. They're suggesting that technology, which we always think of as a force for good, could be used to create this, well, subtle but incredibly effective form of coercion. And it's something that we really need to be aware of as we move forward. It really does feel like we're headed towards this digital panopticon, like in those sci-fi movies, where everything you do is being watched and controlled. Kind of makes you feel helpless, you know? I can see why you'd feel that way. It's easy to feel powerless when you're up against something this big and complicated. 
But, you know, we have to remember that people built these systems. It's not like they're forces of nature or something totally out of our control. That's a good point. It's not like we're totally helpless against technology, even if it feels that way sometimes. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why it's more important than ever to stay informed, to ask questions, to have these conversations. The future doesn't just happen to us. You know, we shape it by the choices we make. And that includes the choices we make about the technology we use, right? Absolutely. We need to be asking ourselves, who benefits from this? Is anyone being left out? And what could the consequences be down the line? We can't just blindly accept so-called progress without at least thinking about the ethics of it all. Yeah, it's like they say, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And maybe that's the biggest takeaway from all of this. Even if you don't believe in this whole New World Order theory, it makes you think about the world we're creating. And not always in a good way. For sure. It's like a wake-up call. This particular speaker, they might see things through a specific lens, but that doesn't mean their concerns aren't valid. They're pointing out real problems that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, they're like they're saying, hey, look at this. Where is this all going? Yeah, exactly. And that's valuable in itself. Even if you don't agree with their conclusions, it makes you think critically. You start to question things and you want to get more involved in what's happening in the world. So where does that leave us? Is this whole New World Order thing real or not? Well, we'll let you be the judge of that. But one thing's for sure. Technology is becoming more and more integrated into our lives. Mm -hmm. And we've got to ask ourselves, who's controlling it? And how could it be used? What kind of world are we building with all this powerful tech? That's the conversation we need to be having. You got it. We get to decide what the future looks like. It's not already decided for us. 